SQL A NLCH is been one of the biggest problems, I guess. I think that up to 50% of patients with LCH do have late effects, and it can be due to the disease or to the treatment. Especially in the past, we were much more aggressive, and I think that that's something that we learned. We also have a lot of endocrine problems. I think diabetes and sepitis is a late effect, and we know that 10 to 20% of patients with LCH do have diabetes and sepitis. It can be handled, you know, with, uh, with fosopressin, but it's it is something you have to take care of the rest of your life. Although your disease can be burnt out, you still can have diabetes and sepitis. Orthopedic problems, jaw, eating problems, lung problems. So there are lots of problems. And I think that um, I'm happy that there are lots of people who are focusing on these kind of problems. And maybe at some point when we get at a very high top that we can cure so many, we can also look how can we cure the same amount with maybe a little bit less aggressive treatment so late effects can be handled a little bit more. So then um, we still, we know a lot about pathogenesis, but we still do not know what is the cause of the disease. You know, we looked at clonality, size cycle, virology, cytokines, blah, 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 blah. I will, last few slides will talk about it, but we still do not know in LCH what is causing this disease. I have thought about it, but I'm not going to share you at this point because um, I might be completely wrong. You know, I really had this feeling that we had a genetic defect in LCH. And I'm, my people in my lab, we are looking and looking and looking. And now with three different kinds of techniques, we don't find any abnormality. So maybe, um, you know, next year or the year after, when we have all the data and we can, um, you know, publish it, and I can tell you, well, with the techniques that we have nowadays, we cannot find a genetic abnormality. So my, maybe in some forms, the skin and the bone, it is only an Im immune disorder. Does it mean, for me at least, that in the very young people, that there isn't something different or abnormal? Because the infants with LCH, they are the worst of the worst. I'm going to switch a little bit to HLH because that is the um, sort of interesting. In my 25 years as a physician, I did a lot on LCH, but you know. I'm a restless person, so I moved around. And for the last seven years, I'm head of a transplant uh, center. So nowadays, I see more age-late patients who are diagnosed at other centers, but who come to our center for a um, transplant. And um, I think that um, it's nice to be a little bit part of this disease, because I think this has been a an, an, an very good example how you can work together and what you can um, find um, in curing disease that up to 20 years ago was almost for everybody lethal. So I told you already, 10 years after the paper in The Lancet, Dr. Favara, who has been the president of the HCC Society, and some of us, we redid sort of the classification because we knew more about the biological behavior of the cells. We have dendritic cells, LCH still on top, but we now have JXG. We know more about it. There are other dendritic cell processes, and I think that this has been helpful, especially for the people who are within the world of physiosotosis, but who are not LCH or HLH. We have the macrophage related, so we switch from class two to the macrophage related. We have the benign macrophage related. Well, what's the word benign if you die from a disease? But again, it's not looking through the microscope malignant because when you talk about a malignant disease, there are mitosis, there are certain different aspects calling something malignant or benign. But as a parent, you do not care. I mean, what you care is, will my child, can it be treated? And although we call this a benign disease, because it's not through the microscope malignant aspects, there are still a lot of patients who do not survive. So, um, what's in the word? So, when we talk about the secondary hemophagocytic syndrome, so that's secondary HLAs, those are patients who have a primary disease, and, um, you know, that can be a malignancy, it can be rheumatoid arthritis, it can be a parasite, and as a secondary phenomenon, they get hemophagocytosis. So, there, it's not the primary disease, and um, it can be. This was actually for the first time described 20, 25 years ago by people in Minnesota, where there were all the people who had HLH syndrome or hemophagocytic syndrome associated with immunosuppressive treatments due to kidney transplants. So what's happening? Well, it's, it's kind of a mess. You have cells that eat. So those cells are the red blood cells, the hem. Hem um, hemoglobulins, those are red blood cells. And as you can see, this is a big cell that eats all those red cells, and that's what's causing, and that's what's giving it the name 
hemophagocytosis. Phagocytosis is eating and heme are the red cells, although it also eats other cells. Hemophagocytic syndrome, this is what you will see under the microscope, and when you see it, you're quite sure. However, often when you make the diagnosis, you still cannot find this. So sometimes with only the signs and symptoms, you already have to make the diagnosis and start treatment. Well, there are actually certain signs and symptoms, and you need to have five of these symptoms to fit the diagnosis HLH. Fever, easy, an enlarged spleen, and all the others. I don't want to go into details, but we try to modify these kinds of uh, guidelines every 10 years. So we make, you know, because we learn more, we want to make it clearer and clearer. Well, when you look at ages, you can see HLH is really a disease of the very young. And um, you can see the majority is in the first two years of life. However, nowadays, and especially from the pen, we get lots of data that there are older patients who have HLH, um, and even the primary HLH. Five years ago, ten years ago, I would tell you, well, if the patient is older than two years, it's probably a secondary. But now, with the newer techniques, we know that there are older patients who have a primary HLH, and, um, you know, up to now, or up to that time, I didn't know about it. I asked Dr. Arico, who had the registry, and again, it's always a little bit biased, but I just want to show you a few of the things. He had the registry with 122 cases, cases, and um, here you can see the, 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 the median age of diagnosis. Up, up, up to almost 50% were familial cases, and there was, at that time, no difference in males or females who get the disease. And just to see some of those guidelines, whether it holds up well, 93 of the patients had fever, 97 have splenomegaly, um, low in your cells, either red, white, or your platelets, up to 85, 90%. So it does those. You know, we noticed that those those um, guidelines really hold on. And again, there were other things. We looked at skin rash, which is always very difficult. You know, when you have uh, a viral disease, you can have a skin rash. So this is always sort of tricky. Pleocytosis is when you take a lumbar puncture, you, because we know that up to 30% of the patients do have um, central nervous system disease in HLA, but here you could see in the registry up to 60% had higher cells, so something was going on, there was some activity there, and maybe that's biased, but we do know we have to check for a central nervous system disease. This is a slide that I took from a, a paper from Dr. Janka. And Dr. Janka has been also, for me, one of the people who have done a lot in this disease. And for me, it was intriguing initially and a diagnosis. So here you can see that people come in with signs and symptoms, and they look, you know, what is happening. For example, fever. Well, 70% had fever, but in the time up to diagnosis, all got fever. So there is a time period people come to the hospital, there are problems. And people are looking, what could it be? You know, you don't, it's, it doesn't work the way that you walk in with the child and said, oh, that's HLH, and let's move on. No. So sometimes you think, is it a viral disease, or is it a, a malignancy? So you look, and what you can see from this graph is that so many of those patients, for example, 50% were low in the cells when they walked into the hospital, but at the time of diagnosis, all had low counts. So also of hemophagocytosis. When they walk in, less than 40%, they could find hemophagocytosis. That doesn't mean that it isn't there, but they couldn't find it. And at diagnosis, of course, because it makes the diagnosis up more than 90%, it was found. So the diagnosis was made. So there is this interval, and sometimes that can be critical, because those children can be very ill, and you have to be really walking on your toes to make the diagnosis and go to the appropriate treatment.